Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel? We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you care to. We're getting ready to have an old-fashioned Bible study here at the chapel. And we began our lecture in our last lecture, the book of Ezra. And Cyrus, in verse 2 of chapter 1, said, The Lord hath given me all the nations of, of the world and has charged me with going, uh, sending the people back to Jerusalem and building his house. Now, that's the most powerful man in the nation, in the world at the time that God did that with, you know. And that's one thing I want you to get out of, of Ezra, that God is in control. If God wants to change someone's mind, he can change someone's mind. If he wants to change who's in power, he can change who's in power, and there's nothing anybody can say about it because he is uh, in control. So uh, as we work our way through Ezra, I want you to keep in mind, too, was, the, was it easy for the people of Judah, uh, Benjamin and Levi? No, it wasn't. But they persevered, and, and that's one thing I want you to learn as we work our way through Ezra is don't give up. You know, Satan, the adversary, the accuser, uh, has he ever given you any trouble in your life when you're trying to do something for God, like plant a seed? You, you, you know what I'm talking about. He'll throw bricks in the road in your path. He'll throw darts at you from behind. But, you know, Jesus gave us power over all of our enemies in the name of Jesus Christ. So don't let Satan beat you up. Uh, you be bold for doing the work for your Heavenly Father and be blessed. And with that, we uh, began chapter 2 in our last lecture, uh, verses 3 through 35. We had the people of Judah that came with Zerubbabel and Ezra, the first group to come out of Babylon. And then in verses 36 through 42, we had the priests and Levites. Now then, we're gonna, I want to kind of skip around here a little bit. We're going to uh, ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name, Father. We ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. We're going to pick it up today, chapter 2, verse 43. Very important verse that we cover. <clears throat> the Nethanims, the children of Ziha, the children of Hasupha, uh, the children of Tebaoth. Now, these are not Hebrew names. Why? Because these are not Hebrew people. And the Nethanims go back to the time of Solomon. And the very name Nethanim means given, uh, given to service, if you will. The, the, the man's name Nathan, very similar. It means given. Now, what happened was these Nethanims started off, their assignments were uh, chopping wood, for the altar fires in the temple, uh, carrying uh, water. Uh, can you imagine how much water it took to, how many buckets it took to fill up the brazen sea? That thing was like a small swimming pool. So, and it had to be uh, emptied out occasionally and filled up with fresh water. So it was a lot of work. But uh, as time went on, the priest became more and more dependent on the Nethanim. Uh, you could say the priests and the Levites became lazy and depended on the Nethanim to do their work for them. Well, as early as, and a lot of them were Kenites as well. Kenites are really good about uh, sneaking in and getting next to someone. Uh, in First Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55, they had already become scribes for the tribe of Judah. And as Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 23, verse 2, the scribes and Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. 
In other words, these Nethanim and Kenites had taken Moses' place, the lawgiver, uh, and were uh, taking over liturgical duties that the priest should be doing. Uh, that's the reason the people got away from God, I believe, and that's the reason they ended up in captivity to the king of Babylon. You want to know who's doing your scribe work? You want to know who's doing your translating? I want to pick up one more verse before we get settled in today. Verse 48 of chapter 2. Uh, the children of Rezin, the children of Nicoda, the children of Gazam. Now I want you to hang on to that name, Nakoda. It's going to come up again in this lecture. Uh, verses 55 through 57, we have the uh, sons or children of Solomon's servants. Now we're not talking about uh, descendants of Solomon here. We're talking about descendants of Solomon's servants. Now, these are thought to be uh, prisoners of war, possibly, um, and the kings, the servants of Solomon, uh, were referred to by that exact phrase of the Canaanites, that's with a C, uh, who uh, helped with the labor of assembling the temple of God. So we're going to settle in now with verse 58 as we continue chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Verse 58. All the Nethanims and the children of Solomon's servants were 392. Now in verses 59 through 63, we're going to have a group of people who were claiming to be of Judah. Uh, in fact, is some of them are going to be claiming to be priests, but they're not. Uh, uh, they're, they're making uh, up stories. Let's go with verse 59. And these were they which went up from Telmila, uh, Telharsa, Cherub, Adon, and Emmer, uh, but they could not show their father's house and their seed, whether they were of Israel. And for the most part, they weren't. Uh, they were lying. And, you know, after 70 years in, in Babylon, in captivity, uh, there's a lot of records lost. And these folks thought, well, no one will know the difference. No one will be the wiser. We'll just slip in and say we're of Judah or Benjamin or the Levites or even uh, worse, we're of the priesthood. Uh, but they couldn't prove their priesthood, their lineage. Now, Telmila, Telharza, and Cherub, Aden, and Emmer. Cherub, Aden, and Emmer is actually one location that reads like there's three locations, but these are three uh, districts or regions uh, in Babylon. Uh, note there's no period at the end of verse 59. I believe the three people mentioned in verse 60, one of them came from each of these three regions as a representative of it. Verse 60, the children of Deliah, the children of Tobiah, the children of Nicoda, remember I asked you to hang on to that name from verse 48, 650 and 2. Now, Nicoda is listed in verse 48. What were those that were in from verse 43 on? They were Nethanims. Uh, they weren't of the priesthood. They weren't of Judah or Benjamin. They weren't Israelites. The word Nakoda, the name Nakoda, if you translate it rather than transliterate it, means temple servant, as in Nethanim, you got it? Verse 61, and of the children of the priests, here we go, they're even claiming to be of the priesthood. The children of Habiah, the children of Koz, the children of Barzillai, uh, which took a wife of the daughters of Brazilii, the Gileadite, Gileadite, and was called after their name. Now this kind of loses it. Barzillai, if you've studied Samuel and Kings, you'll know that he was a very close servant and counselor to King David. Uh, but this, that he was, and we have someone here saying he's of the priesthood, but he took a daughter of Barzillai, the Gileadite, which is, means he's of the tribe of Manasseh. 
A Levite, a priest, would never take a wife of a tribe other than Levi. That's how they kept the priesthood uh, in, in the line that it was in, and the Levites in the line that they were in. <clears throat> Another thing about this, uh, he, he, that must have been quite a dowry for this one to take uh, the name of the inheritance of the, the woman's family rather than keeping the man's family. In other words, we have an individual here who's looking for who can pad his pocket the best. And he's not a, a person of good character claiming to be a priest. Verse 62, these sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore were they as polluted put from the priesthood. This word polluted could be translated unclean. And any time that a priest was in an unclean state or a Levite who had duties in and around the temple was in an unclean state, they excused themselves from service. You didn't go to work for the Lord in an unclean state. So that's what this is saying is that uh, someone caught on to this. Probably Zerubbabel, uh, Ezra uh, realized what was going on, that these people were lying and saying they were of Judah or Benjamin or worse, the priesthood, and they rejected them. They said, no, you're, you're going to be just like a Le Levitical priest who's in an unclean state. You're not going to be allowed to serve in and around uh, the, the worship of the Lord. Verse 63, And the Tershatha said unto them that they should not eat of the most holy things till there stood up a priest with Urim and with Thummim. Now, Tershatha is a, a Persian word. Uh, it, it, probably the best translation for it would be into English as a governor. And in other words, Cyrus appointed this person to be the governor over the province of Judah. Judah, a province of Persia at this time. The Tershatha that's mentioned here was probably uh, Nehemiah. Uh, he, Nehemiah is three times called a Tershatha in the book of Nehemiah, which follows Ezra, or it could be in reference to Zerubbabel. Uh, Zerubbabel also called the Tershatha. Now, not to eat the most holy things. Uh, you may or may not know there are uh, seven holy things. Four of them are most holy. The four most holy things are the incense offering, uh, the sin and trespass offering, the showbread offering, and the minka, which is the meal or meat offering. Only the priest were to eat the most holy things. Uh, of course, that would exclude the incense. Uh, incense wasn't eaten. It was uh, burned uh, to worship the Lord. But you know, what the Tershatha, whether it be Nehemiah or Zerubbabel, is saying is we're going to wait and inquire of the Lord uh, when we have a high priest that has the ephod, a little pouch that was attached to the breastplate of the high priest uh, where the Urim and Thummim were kept and the, that was seen as God's judgment as yes or no whether these would be allowed to serve in the priesthood. Obviously God would say no. He chose the Levites and uh, specifically the sons of Aaron to be the priests and it would be an abomination to our Heavenly Father for a Gentile to assume those duties. Verse 64, The whole congregation together was forty and two thousand three hundred and three score. We've got forty-two thousand three hundred and sixty that came out of Babylon led by Zerubbabel and Ezra. Now, there will be another group that Ezra will lead out uh, of Babylon in chapter 8, 
and it's a little bit ironic, we've been talking about the Nethanims, and when uh, Ezra got a little ways out from Babylon, he kind of took a poll account of the head count, and he said, now, now, how many of you guys are Levites? Or, and there wasn't one Levite among the group that came out, the second group that came out with Ezra. What he had was a bunch of Nethanim. And you know, that's just a sign of how uh, lazy the priests and the Levites had become. They wanted to just stay in Babylon rather than to uh, travel the four months. It would be a hard journey uh, to, for, to make the trip from Babylon back to Judah, or 65 beside their servants and their maids, of whom there were 7,330 and seven. And there were among them 200 singing men and singing women. Now, a couple things on this. The uh, singing men and singing women are not to be confused with the Levitical singers or musicians. Uh, we kind of skipped over that in verse 41 of chapter 2, there you have uh, descendants of Asaph and the, the Levitical musicians who were responsible for overseeing the worship of the Lord through music. Hebrews from uh, time immoral have hired singers, uh, whether it be for a wedding uh, where the songs would be of jubilation or for a funeral where the songs would be of lamentation. Uh, some of the higher critics think that the copyist whose tired eyes overlook this word, the word for cattle or oxen in the Hebrew language is very similar to singing men and singing women. Uh, I think the higher critics are looking for ways to uh, say that God's uh, word is riddled with errors and mistakes, and I'll go with the singing men and singing women. Now, another thing that struck me about this verse, 7,330 and seven servants and maids. And, you know, Jeremiah the prophet told the people of Judah that if you will go peaceably into captivity to the king of Babylon, you'll have it good. Now, having maids and servants, uh, that doesn't sound like they had it too bad in captivity. Verse 66, their horses were 730 and six, <clears throat> their mules 240 and five. Now, it, as I said a moment ago, will be a long, hard journey, a four-month journey. Now, these animals would not be used to ride, uh, like uh, for a person to ride on them. Very few of the people rode on them. Consider these people were taking all, bringing all of their possessions with them to returning to the promised land. So. Uh, no doubt that these beasts of burden, they put their possessions on the backs of the beast of burden, but then the people walked for four months to get back to uh, the promised land. 67, their camels, 430 and five, their asses, 6,720. And Cyrus, you might recall in, in chapter one, encouraged the people who lived near the Hebrews in the land of Babylon, the, the, where Israel, or Judah, I should say, sojourned. And Cyrus asked the people to be generous with their livestock and their gold and their silver and help the people of Judah because they were basically going back uh, to start over from scratch. And you can see by the number of, of animals and livestock that were that the, uh, the people of Judah had that evidently those neighbors uh, were very generous. Cyrus was generous as well. Verse 68, And some of the chief of the fathers, when they came to the house of the Lord, which is at Jerusalem, 
offered freely for the house of God to set it up in his place. Not much left of Solomon's temple after the third siege of Nebuchadnezzar, not much less left of Jerusalem. But I like this, the, the, the chief or the heads of the fathers. These are the leaders. And you know, as the leaders of a nation go, so go usually the people. And so you see the people, the leaders of those who came out of Babylon saw that it was important to reestablish the temple, uh, which would then uh, bring about the reestablishment of the worship of Yahweh. And they saw that as being very important for their success. Very true. Verse 69. They gave after their ability under the treasure of the work threescore and one thousand drams of gold and five thousand pound of silver and one hundred priest garments. Very generous for just having come out of seventy years in captivity to the Babylonians. But again, an indication they didn't have it all that bad in Babylon. Now I can just see the Nethanim when they saw these 100 priest garments show up, they probably said, oh, send a couple dozen of those over there. Here, we're going to need those uh, as they tried to take over the priesthood. Verse 70, so the priest and the Levites and some of the people and the singers, now we are talking about the Levitical musicians here, and the porters, the porters were a division of the Levites that were uh, guards for the doors, uh, porters, if you will. They were uh, security, if you would. Uh, and the Nethanims dwelt in their cities, and all Israel in their cities. They all went back to their possession. Uh, now, again, some of these folks, as we'll see in chapter 3, uh, were born in the promised land in, in Judah, Benjamin and Levi, before they went into captivity. And it's going to be quite emotional when they come back and see the beginnings of the foundation of the temple being constructed once again on the site where Solomon's temple was. In chapter 3, we're going to have the altar of burnt offering erected in the place where it was before. Keep in mind, it was totally destroyed. Uh, and this would be necessary to reinstitute the worship of the Lord. Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles will be celebrated in chapter 3, and the temple foundation uh, finally laid. Let's go with chapter 3, verse 1. And when the seventh month was come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Now, this, when the seventh month was come, when we get to verse 6, we'll see that the seventh month hadn't started yet. What this is saying is, as the seventh month approached, the people gathered together in Jerusalem. Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles was one of three major ingatherings annually among the people of Israel. Uh, first, you had the Passover. Uh, secondly, you had the Feast of Weeks, which later became known as uh, Pentecost. Then you had, uh, finally, the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, the seventh month, which is called Tishri, on the Hebrew calendar was a very sacred month. The month started off, the first day was a, a feast day. It was called the Feast of Trumps. And the priest would blow the shofar, the silver trumpets, and actually uh, ring in the sacred month, if you will. Uh, on the 10th day of the Tishri, you had the Day of Atonement which was the day that the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies. Only one day of each year did the high priest do this, but not without the blood of an ox and a goat for the sins of the people and his own sins. Uh, the Day of Atonement, the purpose of it was to atone or cover the sins of the year that had not been expiated by other means. 
Then on the 15th of Tishri, you had the actual Feast of Tabernacles, which was a seven-day feast. And then to close the feast of the cycle feast uh, for the year, there was even a, a Sabbath on the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And it wasn't part of the Feast of Tabernacles. It was a separate Sabbath. Verse 2. Then stood up Yeshua, Yeshua the nephew of Ezra, and he was the high priest at the time that this, these events happened. The son of Josadak and his brethren, the priest, and Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel being of Judah, the son of Shealtiel and his brethren, and builded the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And the word God here in the manuscripts has the article, meaning the true God. Now, uh, again, restoring legal sacrifices to the Lord uh, necessary for the nation to receive blessings. Uh, Josadak uh, is mentioned in 1 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 14, as being in the same family, a brother to Zariah. Zariah was the father of Ezra, uh, and again, Ezra being the uncle of Yeshua. Zariah, the father of Ezra, was killed by uh, Nebuchadnezzar at Riblah. Verse 3, And they set the altar upon his bases, for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries. And they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening, reinstituting the daily uh, burnt offerings to the Lord. Now, the set the altar on his bases. Uh, remember, the altar was destroyed by the Babylonians, so they had to rebuild the altar. But what this is saying is they put the altar back in the same location where it was previously uh, in Solomon's temple. Well, what's this? Fear was upon them because of the people of those countries. Well, you see, the ten northern tribes of Israel were in captivity to the Assyrian at this time, uh, when they took the people of Israel out of the land and carried them away captive to Assyria, they brought in uh, people who became known as Samaritans. And they were a mixed bag of nations. They were a mixed bag of uh, religions. And they're taking note that the people of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi are coming back and rebuilding. And this also is a good indication to me that the events of Ezra happened before the events of Nehemiah because had there been a wall around Jerusalem, there would have been no reason for them to fear. But the northern portion of Jerusalem, you could approach and it was basically flat land, uh, very level. And a city without a wall around it was seen as being uh, basically defenseless. So I think they were making these offerings and, and asking for God's protection, for God to put a wall of protection around them. And I hope God is your wall of protection against all evil and against all enemies. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 4. They kept also the Feast of Tabernacles as it is written and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the custom as the duty of every day required. And the instructions for the Feast of Tabernacles given in Leviticus uh, chapter 23 uh, verse 34 in the following verses. And there were, uh, it was a seven day feast as I mentioned earlier and there were a prescribed number of sacrifices to be made each day. On the first day, 13 bullocks, two rams, and four lambs were to be offered. Uh, the second day, the number of bullocks was reduced to 12, but the rams, two, and the lambs, 14, stayed the same. And each consecutive day, 
the number of bullocks was reduced by one. Verse 5. And afterward offered the continual burnt offering, both for the new moons and of all the set feast of the Lord that were consecrated, and of every one that willingly offered a free will offering unto the Lord. This latter free will offering, a burnt offering, and it was an approach uh, offering. In other words, when someone wanted to approach God, they would make this offering. They had to be uh, clean and, and sin free to do so. Now this new moons uh, by sin free, I mean they had to have atoned for their sins with a sin or trespass offering as the case may be. Now those of you who've been studying God's Word any length of time at all know that the Hebrew calendar was set up on solar, not lunar, not, not months, and I think, though, that there, there was only, some people take this to mean that every month that the people celebrated a feast. That's not the case, I don't believe. I think that this only applied to the first day of the seventh month, Tishri, which was the Feast of Trumps, verse 6. From the first day of the seventh month, now here we see the seventh month beginning, uh, began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. And we will see that foundation of the temple work begin in verses 7 through 13. They gave money also unto the masons and to the carpenters and meat or food of any sort, and drink, most likely wine and oil, unto them of Sidon and to them of Tyre. Now, uh, this is where the cedars of Lebanon came from for the original Solomon's temple. Uh, they're making the same agreements as David and later Solomon did to trade uh, food, drink, uh, wine, and oil for these uh, cedars of Lebanon, to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea of Joppa according to the grant or permission that they had of Cyrus king of Persia. Now, a couple things on this. The uh, Joppa uh, is not a sea. The sea that they utilized to transport these sea, uh, cedars of Lebanon was the Mediterranean. and They basically lashed or tied the tree trunks together and made large floats out of them. And then they brought them to Joppa, which was the seaport for Jerusalem. It's in existence even to this day. It's called J-A-F-F-A -F -F -A today, Jaffa rather than Joppa. Verse 8, Now in the second year of their coming into the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month began Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Yeshua, the son of Josadak, the high priest, Ezra's nephew, and the remnant of their brethren, the priest and the Levites, and all they that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem, and appointed the Levites from twenty years old and upward to set forward or to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. And the service uh, age for the Levites actually originally was 30 years old. Uh, it was reduced to 25 years old at one point and in, during the time of David it was changed to 20 years old. Why? Because it was no longer necessary to pick up the tent, the boards, pillars, and sockets and the coverings and physically carry them from one location to the other as the uh, temple obviously of Solomon was a permanent structure. So uh, it's a good place to stop today but uh, Zerubbabel, make a note of Zechariah chapter 4 and it states there that Zerubbabel held the plumb bob 
for the foundation of the temple. In other words, making sure that the foundation was level. If you start off crooked, you're going to end up probably even more crooked. So you want to make sure that you have a good level foundation to start with on which to build. So you're uh, going to see that it's not going to be easy. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, there are going to be uh, slowdowns, there are going to be complete stoppage of the building of the temple. There will be a, a pause of some 15 years as we'll see. Um, and it's all Satan, you know. Uh, Satan does not want to see God's work done. And if you are doing God's work, you better expect him to attack you. He's go it's going to happen, friend. Uh, what do you do? Well, you rebuke him in the name of Jesus Christ, and then you be bold for your heavenly Father to do his work. Don't miss any of these lectures in, in, in Ezra or Nehemiah. They're very important. Uh, we've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word the world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular CDs. How and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you have always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us at Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour. Uh, we, and let's have the 800 number, please, 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, the U.S., and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to possibly be answered on the air, feel free to call that 800 number. Uh, please don't ask for a written response to your questions or expect someone that answers the phone to answer your questions. Uh, we only answer questions this format here on the air and one of the pastors uh, handling the questions. Uh, please don't ask questions about a specific individual denomination or organization by name. We try to teach God's Word in a positive format uh, throwing out negative about others by name, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ, serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing, fully capable of all three. If you're listening by shortwave radio from somewhere around the world or studying via the Internet, uh, and you're not able to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in being the point. Got a prayer request? You don't need a telephone number. We can do away with it. Your Heavenly Father is there for you 24-7. Uh, he doesn't sleep. Uh, he, he never is inattentive to your needs. So you can go to him, and I encourage people to do it at least daily. Make time to talk to your Heavenly Father. I really don't believe you have a lot of competition these days. Everyone's so busy uh, taking care of, of making a living, and they don't have time for God. And, you know, he's got feelings just like we do. We, we were created in his image, so he has feelings and emotions. And I imagine it hurts his feelings when his people... Uh, forget about him and forsake him. You forsake him, he will forsake you. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to look upon these, Father. You know their needs, illness, Father. We, we need that touch of healing, uh, financial difficulties, marital problems. You know, Father. 
if it is your will, a special blessing on each of these. And we also lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world. Father, watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions, see what's on the mind of folks around the country. Uh, first up today, we have Lisa in Montana. <clears throat> is Satan the only one in the pit during the thousand years, the millennium? Thank you and your staff for all you do, and thanks for remembering our staff. We have a, a very few in number, but very capable in, in getting the job done, volunteers and uh, staff here at the chapel. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 and 3, no one else but Satan is written uh, of going into the abyss uh, for the thousand years. So I think it's safe to think he's going to be alone for that thousand year period. But don't forget, he's going to be loosed for a short season following that, and he'll have one more chance before he goes uh, to to deceive God's children before he goes into the lake of fire. And from Georgia, <clears throat> uh, in the end, when we all leave our earthly bodies, will there be enough animals to eat all the dead flesh, or will the flesh just lay there and rot in the sun? Well, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 14 in the Minor Prophets gives a pretty graphic description of what it's going to be like. You know, uh, animals won't eat the flesh because in Isaiah chapter 11, we learn that the uh, wolf will lay down with the lamb. Why? Because they're not going to be in flesh. There will be no more carnivores. Um, and what is going to happen? Well, you know, God is in control, and I'm sure he has a plan, and I'm sure it's a well-thought-out plan, and there will be no problem. Linda in Ohio, um, I want to thank you uh, for your lifelong commitment of teaching and helping so many understand the Bible. I want to thank you because when I was a young lady, I thought something I said that I was doomed to hell. When I got older and started a family, I took my children to church and they were baptized, although I thought I would never get to be in heaven with them. This made me very sad for many, many years. Then, while at church, I never heard any different either. I had found Shepherd's Chapel on TV and found it very interesting, so I continued to watch and I heard Pastor Arnold teach on the unpardonable sin, and I knew that wasn't what I had done years earlier. Uh, I know you can understand my relief and joy to learn I can go to heaven and be with my loved ones and children. I have repented, and I know now God has forgiven me. Well, good for you, and God bless you. It, it, it isn't possible at this point in time that anyone has committed the unforgivable sin. So uh, I encourage anyone who has fallen short, and that's all of us, we all fall short. There's not one of us that can claim that we're without sin and do it honestly. So what do we do when we fall short? That's the beauty of Christianity. You repent and you ask for forgiveness and uh, God's grace is sufficient to cover all sin. The blood of Jesus Christ was sufficient to cover all sin. Julie from Washington. Dear Pastor Dennis, thank you very much for your wonderful teachings. You're welcome. It's a, it's a labor of love, believe me. Whenever I try to explain what really happened in the garden and who the Kenites are, I'm told, no, it was just an apple and they think I'm crazy for thinking such a thing. When I learned of this by watching your program, it all made perfect sense to me. I can see why there will be so many in bed with Antichrist and follow him. My question is Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 5 through 13. 
the four-sided creatures, does it mean four different dimensions or countries? The four living creatures in Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 5 and the following verses are the same as the four beasts of Revelation chapter 4 verse 7. If you're familiar with the Greek and the Hebrew names for them, it's Zun and Zoi. Their original, well, their function to this day is to protect the throne of God. Uh, I think it's very interesting to study Israel's encampment, and you had a certain setup, and that was all by God's design. Uh, and if you study Numbers chapter 2, there were four of the 12 tribes of Israel that had a camp, and they were on the four sides of God's throne. Uh, Judah, the symbol of a man, which was the face of one of the four beasts of Revelation, also Ezekiel chapter 1. Uh, Reuben uh, was, excuse me, Judah was the lion, I misspoke. Uh, Reuben was the symbol of a man. Now, each tribe had a flag that had a, a standard on it. Uh, the lion of Judah was their standard. Uh, Reuben was the sign of man. <clears throat> Ephraim was the ox or calf, and Dan the eagle. I bet, <clears throat> excuse me, it's going to be very interesting to see uh, what it is the setup in the millennium, or better yet, in the eternity, uh, something to do with those uh, four camps of the tribes of Israel is got something to do with the Zun and the Zoi. I'm sure of it. I'm, uh, it's going to be interesting to find out what that is in the future. John in Kentucky, please explain Leviticus chapter 22, verse 5. And it states there, whosoever uh, toucheth any creeping thing is unclean, or a man of whom he may take uncleanness, whatsoever uncleanness he hath. Uh, creeping things are basically bugs, if you will. The latter part of the verse is talking about coming in contact with a man who is unclean uh, for the reasons listed in Leviticus chapter 15, verses 7 through 19, having to do with a, a running issue. Daniel in Texas, my question, the children of God and the angels, are they one of the same or are they different? I believe that we were with God before we came to earth, but I have a hard time trying to explain this. Can you give me scripture that would help? Yes, I believe I can. Uh, Job chapter 1 verse 6. And what was going on there, Satan, well, first of all, God and the sons of God, meaning the angels, were together. And Satan came up. And God said, hey, Satan, where have you been? And he said, I've been walking to and fro on the earth. But they're called the sons of God or the angels, just as in Genesis chapter 6, verse 2. Uh, those are called the sons of God. They are the fallen angels there <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 6. C.G. in Texas. Someone said to me that if I don't go to a certain denomination church that I won't go to heaven. Well, that person told you wrong, and I can assure you that John 3.16 doesn't mention any denominations as those who have eternal or everlasting life. You know, there, would, there are no denominations, again, mentioned in John 3.16. Uh, guess what? There won't be any denominations in the eternity either. I'm sure that breaks a lot of people's heart because they're planning on being in that section of the heaven that is for this denomination and or that denomination is down the road and all of them think they're the only ones up there. Uh, they're deceiving themselves. That's not the way it's going to be. Denomination means division. And denominations of Christianity are divided because they have different 
thoughts on different subjects, different beliefs. There's only going to be one uh, line of thought and belief in heaven, and that's God's, not the traditions of men. Roy in Tennessee or Indiana, where in the Bible does it say Satan will come here before Jesus does? Well, many places. Uh, one of my favorites is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 makes it very clear what events have to happen before Jesus returns. And it makes it very clear there that Satan shows up uh, claiming to be uh, God or Jesus himself. Matthew 24 and Mark 13 also tell us the events that must come to pass before Jesus returns. And you've got Antichrist here before Jesus returns at the second advent. Carol from Michigan, please tell me the three generations, I think she means the length of generations, and where to find them in the Word. Well, you have a 40-year generation, a 70-year generation, and a 120-year generation found in God's Word. The 40-year generation comes from the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 14, where God judged the nation of Israel to wander in the wilderness, the desert, for 40 years until that generation died and then their children would move in and possess the promised land. A uh, 70-year generation you'll find in Psalm 90, uh, verse 10, three score in 10 years, a score is 20, three tw times 20 is 60, plus 10 is 70. A uh, 120-year generation you find in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. Hope that helps. Michael from Pennsylvania, 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Is the letter, the Ten Commandments, if it killeth, should the ten be followed? Yes and yes. The, the letter is the law. And we should do the best uh, we can uh, to follow God's commandments. Uh, what this verse means is that if we, um, if it, uh, up to us living by the law, none of us would have salvation. In other words, the law was good, but man is bad. And without Jesus Christ, none of us would find salvation if we were being judged by the law. <clears throat> Ellen in Missouri. Um, first, God bless you and family. Thank you and, and God bless you as well. I have put this one on the shelf many times and have taken it off many times. The four virgin daughters of Philip. What are their names and where can I find them? Well, uh, they are not named. Uh, they're mentioned in Acts chapter 21, verses 8 and 9. It just simply states there that Philip had four virgin daughters and all of them did prophesy. That means to teach. David in Georgia, dear Pastor Dennis, I am writing to ask when I study on my own afterwards, 10 minutes or so later, I can't remember what I read. I have to underline or highlight scripture to help me. <clears throat> My question is, will I fall to the Antichrist if I can't remember scripture? I would feel sad knowing I failed my father. I love him and I do not want to fail him. Thank you, Pastor Dennis. Much love to you and your staff. Well, much love right back at you, uh, uh, David. Memorizing scripture is not important to understanding scripture. David, I'm sure that you understand that the Antichrist comes first. And you understand that to worship him is to uh, is the unforgivable sin if you're one of God's election. And you're not going to fail your father. You're going to be a soldier for your heavenly father. <clears throat> John in Tennessee. I take issue with a lot of your teaching. I think you are misleading a lot of people. However, I want, 
I want to get in, I won't get into all that, just one thing. I heard your announcer say to the word Exodus that it means was in the name of. It's common knowledge that Exodus means a departure or coming out. What say you to this? Well, I don't know for what you heard that Exodus, oh, well, the title of Exodus is what is the beginning? Go to verse 1 of Exodus chapter 1, and it states there, these are the names. That's the name of the book, just as uh, Genesis, uh, the, the whole book of Genesis, the, you go to the first verse, in the beginning. That's what Genesis means. Leviticus, uh, by Yikara in the Hebrew tongue, means the Lord called. If you go to verse 1 of Leviticus chapter 1, the Lord called. Numbers is in the wilderness. Deuteronomy, these are the words. You got to go back to the Hebrew to know what I'm talking about on that, but that's where the names of the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible came from was what the verse, first verse starts out. Kathy in Michigan, please explain 2 Peter chapter 3 and how this relates to the three world ages. Well, verse 3 states, in the last day shall be scoffers look around you today. There are a lot of scoffers. They scoff Christians, they scoff God, they scoff Jesus Christ. Verse 4, they say, saying, where Christ, where is Christ? I don't think he is coming. And then verses 5 and 6, willingly ignorant that by the word of God the heavens were of old, that's the first earth and heaven age, the world that then was was overflowed with water. That's not talking about Noah's flood. That's talking about the flood of Jeremiah chapter 4. I'm out of time. I love you all a great deal. Why? Because you do enjoy studying God's Word in depth. And, and you'd love to have Him touch you with knowledge and understanding. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important, though, and it's this, you stay in His Word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645. 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.